and about man's propensity to sin and be unholy. That becomes very clear as well. God has always required that his people would stand out above the crowd, that they would be different, that, that they would look different because they act different, because they take on the character of God. The children of Israel were so blessed by him. They were freed from the oppression of bondage in Egypt. And you would think that that would never escape their mind, but it did. They forgot Jehovah as their Savior as time went on. But we can learn from that. We can learn from the mistakes of Israel that a relationship with God can be a struggle. That is something we have to work at when our heart is not fixed on Him. If we are not totally devoted to Him. Therein lies the key. That we have to have a heart that is unchanging. A heart that is totally devoted to God. And that's what God has always wanted from His people. Days old or today. Once delivered from the chains of Egypt, the children of Israel quickly broke their promise with God. Because indeed there was a promise that was made. God offered a covenant to Israel when they were at Mount Sinai. A covenant is just that. It is, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's an agreement. It's a promise. In the eyes of God, a covenant with Him is binding. As should be any time we make a promise. Sometimes I think it's easy for us to say the words, Well, I promise I'll do that. But we forget what a promise is. I'll tell you a quick story I learned years ago when our girls were small. Sometimes you're busy with so many things going on and the girls would want to do something. And I remember the occasion more than once where I said, okay, listen, we can't do that today, but maybe we'll do that this weekend. I promise. And the weekend would come or whenever it was and I would be reminded, but daddy, you said we would do this. You promised. Oh. They understood what I did not. That when you make a promise, you're making a commitment. It's an agreement. It's a covenant. God made a covenant with his people, the children of Israel. And it was not some small thing. In fact, it was, could I say, it was quite dramatic. Some three months or so after their, their, their release from Egyptian bondage, and they are at Mount Sinai. Some incredible things happen as we see the account in Exodus chapter 19. Would you look with me? There in Exodus chapter 19, the children of Israel, as they are gathered around Mount Sinai, God appears to them on the mountain. And it's a scene that you would think would, would never escape their mind. And it is here that a covenant is made. Moses had been up before God and God called because God called him to the mountain and, and God said, here's what I want you to say to the house of Israel. I want you to give them my message. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And Moses did that. He went down and he told that to the elders and to the people. So they would know and understand, here's the agreement that we have made. And that God wanted to speak to them. I think the people were even afraid to even be in the presence of God. And in verse 8, the people responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. You hear what they said? We will do everything that the Lord has said. This was the promise. This was the agreement. It was their covenant with God. 
And the Lord came and He appeared to them as they prepared for three days and they, and they met the Lord at the mountain. And there was fire on the mountain and the earth shook and there was thunderings. And it was an event that, that you would think could never be forgotten. They worshipped God at Mount Sinai. What an incredible experience as they stood in the presence of God Almighty. And like we said, an event surely they would never forget. And they didn't. Well, at least not for 40 days. Yes, in just, in just a short period of time. They forgot the agreement. It did slip them. And they soon forgot about that covenant. Moses came down off the mountain where he had been receiving more instructions from God. And when he came down, he found them worshiping a golden calf. And can we even imagine? We think about, we think about how upset Moses was. What about God? Can we imagine how disappointed God was? That these whom he had delivered from Egyptian bondage and had carried them to this point and had made great promises and blessings to them and they promised that they would obey always what he said so quickly had forgotten him. Can you imagine how disappointed God must have been? And God saw their sin and he was so angry. Chapter 32, the story continues. Chapter 32, in verse 9. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. The Lord said, I... I'm through with Israel. Moses, you stay with me. But I am through with these people. God's judgment, we think, isn't that a little severe? Isn't that a little over the top? But God's judgment can be severe in our minds when we do not have a good sense of sin and what that is and what that does. It was Moses who was the mediator who stepped in. It was Moses who was the one who made intercession for the people. Verse 30. The next day Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, but now I go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make an atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed, that they have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Moses prayed that they would be forgiven their sin, but really, what else could Moses say? There was no excuse that could be made. There was no denial. It was pretty obvious. The consequences of sin was separation from God. What an incredible thought and what an incredible fear would come upon the people when they realized the separations from God that now they had to face. Verse 33, the Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. There will always be consequences. Our sin will always bring consequences. The first and most dreadful is the idea that we are separated from God. The relationship has changed. You remember how this began, this lesson began, the relationship that God called Israel to have with them. A covenant was made, an agreement, a promise. We will do everything that the Lord God has commanded. It didn't last long. And they left God. They walked away. Now there are consequences because of that, because of their sin. And God will punish them. And because of their sin at the time of God's choosing, verse 35, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made for them. It had to happen. Punishment, that is. Because of their sin. 
Because of their sin, because of their sin, God had rejected them. And God withdrew Himself from them. He had no choice. He had no choice but to do so. Chapter 33, verse 3. Go up into the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. Can you imagine? Can you imagine God saying that? Go on up to the land of milk and honey, but I'm not going with you. Because if I do, I'll probably kill you before you get there. That's how disappointed. That's how angry God was. God withdrew Himself. And He had no choice. Really and truly, God had no choice because holiness cannot dwell with unholiness. God who is righteous and pure and holy could, could not accept those who had rejected Him and everything that He represented. Th th there could not be a walking hand in hand. God separated Himself. And the people came to realize their peril. They understood now the seriousness of their sin. And they understood the seriousness of separation from God. And that scared them. And they regretted their sin. <laughs> Chapter 33, verse 4. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. And so the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Their ornaments, the idea of, of the idols or gods that they were wearing, that they were carrying. So we wonder how far they had moved away from God in a short period of time. They're worshiping that. We know the golden calf, but they have their own idols too. Strip these off is what the Lord is saying. The guilt is heavy. And it, now, now the seriousness of the situation is becoming very real. And they humbled themselves before God. They lowered themselves before God. And now their repentance is becoming evident. Still, Israel needed a mediator. They needed someone to intercede for them it was at Sinai Mount Sinai that Moses once again had been on the mountain top with God where Moses prayed for the people chapter 34 and verse 8 and whenever Moses went out to the tent all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents. Watching Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Interject that text. Just to understand. Just to get the picture. Moses being the one that's interceding for the people, and the people can see that. They see how they are separated from God. And how they're calling upon Moses and needing him to be a mediator for them. Chapter 34. And in verse 8. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this stiff-necked people, this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. It's a big favor to ask. The petition of Moses to God is significant. He acknowledges that this is a stiff-necked people. I know, I see, I understand. But please, 
Can we move beyond this? Can you see the change of heart, the repentance of these people? And Moses asked that they might be brought into relationship with God once again. He's saying, please take us back. They were contrite. They had been humbled. They had repented and asked forgiveness. And amazingly, God offered a covenant once again. Chapter 34, verse 10. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Here's God's willingness to again draw them back, to bring them back, to accept them. And you have to stop and you have to step back just a minute and just, just try to get a picture of God. No, oh, I, I, I know we can't see him with our eyes, but get a picture of his character, his mercy, grace, his willingness to take back those who have sinned and moved so far away from him. His willingness to do that. His willingness to consider those who have sinned so greatly but had returned to him. They'd repented. And the evidence of a contrite heart was there. We need to understand repentance. The Bible talks a lot about repentance. The word repent or repentance or repented is used over a hundred times in Scripture. One definition that I found by Thayer that I thought was most helpful. What is repentance? It is a change of mind. Especially the change of mind of those who have begun to abhor their own errors and misdeeds. And have determined to enter upon a better course of life. Isn't that what Israel did? When they, were, when they were pulled low, having seen their sin, and understood how that moved them so far away from God, and they hated that, they regretted that, it scared them. And they had a change of heart, and they moved close to Him again. In the New Testament, the message is delivered time and again to a people guilty of sin, that what was needed was repentance. That there had to be a change of heart, a change of mind on their part. Repentance is what needed. In the New Testament, it, kind of, it starts really with John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. As John the Baptist is teaching out by the Jordan River saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 3 verse 2. It's just a little while later in Matthew chapter 4 that now it is the Lord who is at a time when he is about to begin his ministry, as we say. He's tempted by Satan. And in chapter 4 and verse 17, it is, uh, it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. It's verse, verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he said. It's the same thing John had been preaching that Jesus says. Because on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, men and brethren, what should we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Peter said that. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 25, what is he preaching? What is he saying? In all humility he tells Timothy, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will give them repentance. To the acknowledgement of the truth. 
Verse 26, And they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. The purpose of preaching is to bring people to repentance, to draw those who are far removed from God, to draw near to him, to see the separation that is between us and God, and be fearful of that. To, uh, to hate that and to abhor our own sins in such a way that we want and we are willing to put them off, to put them away, to repent of them that we might draw near to God. And we think, you know, why, why is this sermon topic, repentance, so prominent in, in, in the preaching, in the teaching of not just the New Testament but the Old Testament as well? Why? Because of sin. And the propensity of man to fall in sin. Sin destroys our relationship with God. When one violates the law of God, we have to repent of that iniquity. And we all have the same malady. We all have the same problem. It is sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Forgiveness is found through the sacrificial gift of God's Son. Therein lies our hope that is given and offered freely to all, but can be received only by those who humble themselves and draw near to God, having repented of their sins. You see, we are not unlike the children of Israel of long ago. We need a relationship with God. We do. We need a relationship with God. And to have a covenant relationship with God, much like people of long ago, it requires several things. God offering a covenant. We don't live under the, the covenant that Israel delivered to the children of Israel. A different law for a different time, but nonetheless, God offers for us a covenant. An agreement to walk with Him. And He has done that through His Son. Hebrews 9 verse 20 says, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded to you. Where God is, is offering a covenant to us. He's offering that to us. There in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 13, let me read this to you, verse 13 through 15. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Jesus Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In the fullness of the text, there's the comparison made of what the law offered and what we have in Christ, which is so much greater, so superior. Verse 15, for and for this reason, he has made the mediator, he is made the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. We need a mediator. Just like Israel long ago. And Moses was the one who was the mediator between Israel and God. We have a mediator too. The Son of God is the one who serves us just that way. He is our mediator. God is offering a covenant relationship with Him. And we understand what that means. The promise. That when we promise something, we have to be serious about that. God is serious about it. And we cannot have a relationship with Him if we do not take the covenant serious. And willingly walk with Him. Putting off sin. And choosing to walk with Him. God is offering a covenant. And we have to agree to it. We have to agree to a covenant with God. And dedicate ourselves to it. Leave the past behind. That's what repentance is. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. That's what we have to do. 
Galatians 2 and verse 20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The Apostle Paul said that. And he was an example of one who had put off what was before, changed his life completely. The one who was the persecutor of the church becomes the persecuted because of his preaching of, of Jesus Christ. God has offered a covenant relationship to us, but we have to agree to it. We have to meet the terms of that. And we must be brought into a close relationship with God through a mediator. We need a mediator, and God has provided. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's who God has offered. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Moses could not do or deliver all that the Lord can. Moses was the chosen mediator of God for a different time and a different law, but now we have that which is much greater. We have a mediator in Jesus Christ. And it's in Him that we can build a relationship with God. If we truly repent, the fruit of such an effort will be evident. John the Baptist told his audience, Therefore the fruits bear fruits worthy of repentance. He said in Matthew 3 and verse 8. Of itself, that indicates a change of life, a turn in life. Jesus would say later, a man is known by his fruits. Paul, when he was still referred to as Saul of Tarsus, was, was the persecutor of the church, as we said. But showed, but showed signs of a change of mind and direction when the Lord appeared to him, and he knew then he had been persecuting the Lord. His heart was changed. For three, day, three days he prayed. Three days he prayed and fasted until an Ananias came to him and said, Saul, why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And immediately he did just that. And no longer was he the persecutor of the church of our Lord, but instead even becomes one who is persecuted. One of the most able defenders of the Lord's cause. Repentance was evidence with Saul. There was regret. There was sorrow. There was prayer. There was confession. And when called upon, he immediately responded so that he could be relieved of sins, washed away. It's not just a matter of confessing a wrong. But it is turning from such a course of life with a desire never to go back to that and obeying God in all that He commands and wants and desires of us. That's what being a Christian is all about. A new life that is devoted to the will of God. And the old is left behind. And by God's grace, by His mercy. We all have that opportunity. And we think, how, 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 could God, how could God take Israel back those years ago? How could He do that? By His grace and mercy. And their humility of heart and repentance. And He offers that to us today. His grace and mercy are not diminished that are offered to us today, who are willing to leave behind sin, repent of that, and turn to Him. And even as Saul of Tarsus, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Sometimes even as a Christian we struggle. Becoming a child of God does not take away temptation, does not make life easy. In fact, sometimes it makes it harder. 
And we wonder sometimes, what do we do when we sin? And I know sometimes the Christians struggle with that. You know, they've, they've, they've been a Christian even for some time, and they sin in some way where there's just great concern. What do I, what can I do? How can God forgive me? By the same means He has once forgiven us. By our covenant to Him. Our promise. And when if we have forgotten that promise, and we fear the position that we are in because we have moved away from Him and God has separated Himself from us, if that scares us, and it should, once again we can be drawn near by the same means that saved us first. First John chapter 1 was read to us a few moments ago as we began. You might want to turn again. We close with this. First John chapter 1. Such an incredible passage to offer us in encouragement and direction and a reminder of the power of the blood of Christ. In verse 5, and this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. The blood that saved us when we became a child of God is still there. And it still flows. And when we regret our sins and we repent of them, we confess our sins. And we choose to walk in the light. It will still cleanse us. It's still there. And it is just as powerful by God's grace and mercy. Do you need to respond to the call of Christ to become a child of God? Are you a Christian who has stumbled and needs to make a change in your life to repent? You know, the Lord is still calling us, wishing that we would come. Do you need to respond? Would you come as we stand and sing?